I'd like to welcome you all this evening to another Zoom presentation by the Lewisboro Garden Club with the help of the Lewisboro Library. Thank you, Cindy. Um, okay, I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight, Michelle McKinnon. Uh, we have had her many times. Uh, Michelle is a Yukon certified advanced master gardener from Sherman, Connecticut. Her interest in landscape design began with transforming a barren suburban property after winning a $5,000 do-it-yourself landscape prize. Michelle designs and installs gardens for clients in northern Fairfield County and enjoys sharing her gardening knowledge with others through lectures, classes, and writing. She is currently completing uh, a book for new gardeners based on common sense, sustainable design practices, which will be uh, published in the coming year. Um, just so you know, we've had Michelle before. Uh, I know that our members have thoroughly enjoyed her because most of she has a very common sense approach. And I know that tonight's talk on the wild and wicked weeds will certainly, uh, I'm sure will not be any different. So um, if you have questions as we go along, if you write them in the chat, um, I will save them unless I think that they're really pressing questions Michelle, if that's okay, but otherwise we will save them until the end and you can um, ask your questions then. Okay, Michelle, you're on. Thank you very much, Rose. And thank you to the Lewisboro Garden Club for having me back again. And I also wanna thank Cindy from uh, the Westboro Library who's in the wings, making sure that we don't have any hiccups this evening. So thank you very much for your support, uh, Cindy. So if you are like me, you probably have tonight's topic on your mind a little bit. So if you've been going outside, enjoying the weather when the weather allows us and spending some time in your garden, there's probably something that's on your mind. And that would be tonight's topic, wicked and wonderful weeds. I know when I go out there and uh, to see what's going on when the weather allows I'm noticing that the weeds are quite happy. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. And these cool, um, moist conditions are right up their alley. So you might think there's nothing wonderful about weeds, but I am hoping at the risk of wearing out my welcome that um, you will uh, agree that there are some wonderful aspects. And I'm going to start sharing my slides now so that we can just see some pictures and um, entertain some thoughts about, about weeds. So sometimes the computer just takes a little minute to get going. And sometimes it helps when I press the play button. <laughs> so with your indulgence, I'm going to ask that you open your mind as a as a master gardener and an organic land care professional, I've learned and I've relearned that uh, every organism has a place in the environment and weeds have a place too. So please take the approach of do no harm, no scorched earth policies when it comes to weeds, no matter how vexing they can be. Weeds actually do serve a purpose. They heal the earth, they keep the soil covered and their roots prevent erosion and water runoff. And this was reinforced um, recently. One of my other great loves um, that's probably equal to my love of gardening is my love of reading. And I'm very grateful that our public libraries give us so many opportunities and formats to borrow books in. And I just finished reading Kristen Hanna, The Four Winds. And it's a fictional account of a Texas family suffering through the devastating impact of the Dust Bowl during the Great Depression. And because there weren't effective soil management techniques being practiced at the time, the topsoil that those farm families were so dependent on were scattered by the four winds, just like the family in the story. Now, weeds do serve a purpose besides holding the earth and preventing erosion. They also provide shelter for the tiniest creatures among us. Now, who could do any harm to this adorable little teddy bear of a caterpillar? Don't you just wanna cuddle up with him? When we get out there in the gardens in the springtime and in the fall and do really aggressive cleanups, we could be doing harm to these little creatures. 
So weeds um, are often a place where you'll find little creatures like this taking shelter and hibernating for the winter. So even if we think of weedy areas under trees or at the perimeters of our property, they're actually serving, those weedy areas are serving a very important function. Weeds can also give us some signals about what's going on with our soil. Both of these plants here have tap roots, a dandelion on the left and the, the plantain on the right. And these weeds are indications that we have compacted soil, often very wet soil. Um, certain seed uh, weeds rather can also signal the fact that the soil might be out of balance. There might be too much of, of one kind of nutrient and not enough of another. And it could just in general be an indication that our soil is lacking in, in nutrients overall. Now I wrestled these two weeds out of stepping stones, uh, the little uh, skinny soil areas in between stepping stones in my backyard. And those um, areas do have compacted wet soil and they're especially compacted due to the work of installing the stepping stones. Now, experienced farmers and other people who do a lot of work on the land, they will often read the weeds that are there as to get an indication as to what's going on and to the underlying condition of the soil that they're working with. Weeds also have a lot of medicinal and health benefits, but we won't get into that tonight because that's another whole topic all on its own. I'm gonna invite, invite you all now to, to, um, to use the chat function and answer the question on the screen. Have I convinced you with these last couple of slides that weeds do have some wonderful values? So just type, just type your, your answer in the chat box. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and scroll on down here to see what you're saying. Perhaps, I can go along with that. It takes a while, it takes a while to get your head around this, this kind of idea. So that's all I'm gonna talk in terms of wonderful weeds tonight. Now we're gonna talk about the more wicked aspects of them, or at least somewhat vexing aspects of them. So thanks everybody for responding in the chat. So the rest of the presentation tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about some uh, control practices for weeds. I actually was telling Cindy before we started that um, I would give the, uh, the Cliff Notes version. There is no silver bullet when it comes to weeds, but there are some things that can make it less of a problem for you. We're gonna talk about healthy lawns versus a weed balance. And then we're also going to actually have a show and tell about some actual weeds. And um, I'm gonna hold them up to the screen. I hope you're gonna be able to see them if you maximize um, the view of the speaker uh, using the controls you have, you should be able to see them. And um, if not, we'll revert back to the slides. So first and foremost, when it comes to dealing with any kind of a situation or a problem that you're trying to solve, is um, we have to understand what we're dealing with so that we can get to the true root of the problem. And uh, that pun is intended in this case because one of the aspects about weeds that allows them to persist in the environment is what their root structure is. But first and foremost, in this little illustration here on the screen, um, we have six different aspects of weed plants that help them persist in the environment. And let's start with the simplest one, and that's uh, seeds. So up here in the top left, sorry folks, in the top left, um, we have seeds. So the reason plants exist in the environment, uh, especially annual plants, plants that only live for one year, um, they exist to produce seeds to ensure that a future generation of that plant um, can be viable. So if we control seeds, we can prevent a number of weeds coming into our property. And seeds form after flowers have developed and the flower petals fall off the plant. So if we can get rid of that weed before it even gets a chance to flower, we've saved ourselves a lot of work. By the time the plant has set seed, it could be making our job exponentially more difficult to get that weed under control. So weeds that are spreading by seeds can easily be controlled by hand weeding. 
And I know that's not fun news to anybody. It can be kind of tedious, I admit. But as long as you can cut off the weed at the soil line or just below the soil line, you can just leave it laying there and it will um, shrivel up and desiccate and will be a further problem for you. Um, you can, you can use a, a hoe in a vegetable garden, um, and that's an old standard practice. Hoeing is best done on a sunny day when the soil is dry. Um, if you're doing hand weeding, you'll often find that that works better after a rain when the soil is, is moist and it's a little looser. <clears throat> now, the other remaining points here in this illustration, um, the other five aspects that, that allow weeds to persist make the job of controlling weeds much more difficult. Because if you don't understand what the structure of the weed is and what portion of the plant is helping it to survive year after year, it will make the job much harder. So when it comes to hand weeding plants, you have to know whether or not there is some kind of um, a rooting structure above or below the ground that's helping that plant persist. And in many cases, especially with perennial weeds that come back year after year, they're coming back because these other structures and portions of the plant allow them to do that. They store up nutrients in the soil. It helps them survive the winters, just like our favorite perennials, like our, um, our peonies and such survive the winter. They store up nutrition in the ground. So when it comes to um, the simplest method of controlling weeds, hand weeding is one of the simplest ways, and disposing of flowers, um, seeds, or propagules, or all three of those in that order of priority will help to control some of the weeds that you're dealing with. Now we have some additional manual controls that we can use, um, and some of them are things that you have just around the house, boiling water. This works really well on sidewalks, um, on patios to control those weeds that pop up between the seams. Um, the homemade weed spray uh, recipe that you got yesterday, that's also intended for use on patios and in between stones and so on. Not intended for situations like flower gardens or I wouldn't really see that as being an effective solution uh, for weeds in a lawn for instance. Um, and when you're using that homemade weed spray, um, it has vinegar and salt in it. You know, of course, don't get that in any cuts or in your eyes. And um, also be sure that you shield your uh, prized plants, the plants that you want to, to thrive um, so that they're not exposed to the spray because the spray will damage the foliage. It may not kill off um, one of your favorite perennials, but it certainly will damage the foliage. So all of these methods here will help you keep weeds under control. Um, one method um, that I just want to mention briefly is solarizing the soil. And that's the point, uh, the point here at the bottom of the slide. This is done with clear plastic, clear heavy duty plastic, where you um, would cut off any vegetation on the soil. If, you, if you, this would be for a big patch of weeds or maybe, you know, um, a patch that's uh, gotten away from you, say, at the edge of a lawn or the sort of along the boundaries of your property. It may not work so well. Um, it, you probably wouldn't want to do this on your front lawn, for instance, and it's, it wouldn't be very effective in a, in a perennial garden. Um, however, it is a way to tackle large areas of weeds. Uh, cut off as much vegetation as you can as close to the ground, water the area, and then put your plastic down, secure it with some pieces of board or some stone so that that plastic stays really tight to the ground. And essentially what's going to happen is um, you would do this once it gets even a little warmer. You could do it now, but the weather is still a little cool at night and some days. This works really well uh, when we get into warmer conditions. Uh, essentially the weeds underneath the plastic, they boil from, from the condensation of the moisture out of the ground. It basically bakes the plants inside. Um, you would only do this for a couple of days for maybe five days max and then you could top dress with a little bit of compost and and seed or um, or then plant the area with with desirable plants it works pretty well uh, another thing that will really help you get your weed problem under control is to um, limit soil disturbance 
because every time we turn the soil, we're, we're exposing seeds that are lying dormant in the ground um, and they come to the surface, all they need is a millisecond of light and they get that signal that they need to sprout. So limit soil disturbance. And that's why I say when you're hand weeding, you know, keep one hand on the soil, holding the soil down firmly with one hand and then pulling with the other hand. Again, easier done, uh, best done after the rain makes the job a little easier. Um, another thing that you can do so that you're not turning the soil um, is start to practice uh, sheet mulching and no-till gardening. Um, I've done sheet, uh, sheet mulching. No-till is, is the same idea. It's preparing new garden areas without turning over the soil. So that old practice that was backbreaking where they told us we had to do double digging, you know, and get down, you know, 12 to 24 inches and turn that soil all over. Uh, it's a lot of research is now showing us that that does a lot of damage uh, to the structure of the soil and to the organisms in the soil. And um, I've used sheet mulching extremely effectively to create a new vegetable garden. Uh, the garden is 50 feet long. It's only three feet deep, but I did not have to strip off sod to do it. Also, when we strip off sod, to create a new garden area. We're taking away a lot of the good organic matter that's in the soil that's going to help plants thrive. So um, a couple of things you can try, you can you know, do a Google search on sheet mulching, no-till, um, and lasagna gardening is another term that's sometimes used uh, to describe those practices. So, um, Another thing that can really help you keep ahead of weeds and not let them, uh, you know, get ahead of you is uh, to keep the ground covered. So I was just saying that um, every time we turn over the soil, we're exposing seeds. Well, um, a, a two a two part effective approach to keeping weeds under control for the long term is to first get rid of the weed in whatever way you're going to do that, and then try to get that ground covered. So if you've exposed soil while you're getting rid of a lot of weeds, um, or if you have some kind of a disturbance, like say a great big tree topples over on your property, you want to try to cover up that exposed soil as quickly as you can. Now, if it's in a more refined area of your property, um, you could do something like sowing grass seed. But if you don't have time to prepare the soil effectively for a new lawn, and by the way, that's best done in September, uh, late August into September is the prime time for starting a new lawn from seed. Um, but I digress. Uh, so you want to get that uh, soil covered up. A fast way to do that um, is to put in some, uh, you could put in shrubs, you could put in a fast growing cover crop. So cover crops are often used in the agricultural industry to, again, make sure that the soil doesn't blow away um, in the fall and over the winter. Uh, it's also done to refurbish um, raised beds for people who garden in raised vegetable beds. So you can get uh, seed for uh, cover crops from uh, feed stores and from the sources that I'm showing here on the slides. Uh, buckwheat is a great way to, uh, to hold soil in place and also to improve the soil, but don't let it go to flower. It's, um, it's a good cover crop in the summertime when temperatures are warmer. Winter rye is better suited for the fall and winter season. Uh, you can also keep the soil covered by mulching it. And this goes to the practice that we often uh, follow. You're probably doing it right now, or you've already finished it at your house. You probably put mulch around all your shrubs in your perennial gardens this spring. And that's a practice that we do um, so that we can, again, keep the soil from being exposed, um, keep weed seeds from blowing in. If a weed seed does tend to sp does sprout um, where we've put down mulch, you've probably noticed it's much, much easier to pull up. So we can't really have a discussion about weeds without talking about lawns because I don't know about you, but um, I know a lot of people get really worked up about uh, weeds in their lawn. And um, I, I wonder if any of you actually in the chat box, why don't you say yes or no? Have you seen any of these little lizards 
um, around your property in the last few years? Or do you remember seeing them? Let's start with, do you remember seeing them when you were a child? So maybe that would be the better question to ask. Does anyone remember seeing any little lizards when you were a child? Sometimes you'll see them, unfortunately, on the streets and sidewalks, especially um, probably more into May and June. Um, these little uh, lizards, um, they hatch out from eggs this time of year, and they usually are, are close to wetlands or, or moist little streams on our property. So I've seen these the last couple of years on, on my lawn, and um, you notice here that um, this is a picture taken on my lawn. You notice there's almost as many different weeds represented here as there are blades of grass. But keeping things in perspective and remembering that everything has a place in a natural ecosystem, um, this little lizard doesn't seem to mind the weeds because he's probably intent on getting to um, the little stream that's running along the side of our, my property. So when it comes to lawns, we, we may need to kind of rethink the approaches we've been taking. Um, the practices that we're trying to follow in the United States today really had their beginnings back um, after the Second World War, maybe after the First World War as well. Our servicemen went overseas and when they came back, they were all starting to introduce this idea of this broad expanse of, of green lawn all around our homes. And that was because they had seen this around the fine estates in the English and the um, French countryside. Now, what those service people did not bring back with them was the fleet of gardeners that it took to maintain those beautiful swaths of, of green carpet all around those beautiful country estates. So we really maybe should give some thought to whether or not this is a sustainable practice today. Most Americans spend about 100, or maybe I should say most homeowners uh, in the United States spend about 150 hours taking care of their lawns every single year. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that there's a whole lot of things I'd rather be doing in that 100 and sorry, 150 hours. Um, there's a whole lot more other things I'd rather be doing than being out there being a slave to my lawn. So we, um, we can rethink some practices. Maybe we could develop a certain tolerance for weeds. So, you know, let's ask ourselves, is our, is our lawn about a vanity project? Do we want to have a lawn as gorgeous as, you know, uh, those golf courses that we see on the, uh, the PGA golf tournaments on television? Uh, could you open your mind up or maybe a portion of your lawn to being a freedom lawn? In other words, letting that lawn do as it pleases. So our, maybe kind of like the lawn you saw in that last slide where I had a number of different weeds. Could you be more open to the idea, the Asian um, principle of wabi-sabi where nature takes its course, where there's always some imperfections in nature and that any situation is transient. So from one year to the next, nature will take its course and things will change. They're never, they never standing still in nature. And one final point, uh, if we're giving some thought to our lawns, is I wanted to just talk about lawn services for a minute. Um, I know that many people can, uh, rely on them today. We have busy lives and lawn services can alleviate that work for us. Um, but a couple of years ago, when I was on duty at the Master Gardener office here in Connecticut, a gentleman came in and he was really upset and he had a weed with him and he wanted us to help him identify it. And he said, I'm finding this all over my property. I don't know where it came from, but there's more and more of it um, every month. So it turned out it was Japanese stillgrass, which is an invasive weed. It's an invasive plant. Uh, it's on the official list of invasives here in Connecticut. And I asked him um, if, if he had a lawn service. And he said he did. And he claimed he had never seen this weed around his property before, but this one summer, all of a sudden it was everywhere. So we wondered whether or not the lawn service was um, transporting those, those, um, the seeds around from that plant as they moved from property to property. So you don't really know 
you know, how much cleaning the lawn equipment is getting before it arrives at your house and um, could be spreading weeds onto your property. Continuing on with lawns for just another moment, um, you may not be aware, but both Connecticut and New York State have laws prohibiting the use of any lawn fertilizers that have phosphorus in them. And in New York, the campaign is called Look for the Zero. So that's referring to the middle number on the, the fertilizer bag. So fertilizer bags come with um, a, a three, with three digits on them. The middle digit is um, for phosphorus. So in New York state, it's actually against the law for that number to be anything other than zero, except in the case of a brand new lawn where you're just establishing it. Uh, in that case, it's allowed. And based on what I read, it's supposed to also be allowed when lawns are um, not very, uh, don't have very many nutrients and you want, are trying to rebuild um, the lawn a little bit. But other than that, there should be no phosphorus in use. And if your lawn care company is telling you that you need to put down fertilizer every spring and every fall, you should, um, you should ask them to do a soil test first and find out what the balance of nutrients is in the soil. So if they're telling you you need this, you should have proof from them that that's the case. And it's only $12 to get uh, a soil test done here in Connecticut. I don't know about New York State from the Cornell lab but that's a lot cheaper than having a lawn crew um, spreading, uh, doing a whole lawn treatment for a couple of hours on your property. Um, I'll get off my soapbox now, um, but one thing that you may start hearing about I, if you haven't heard about it this year is no mow May. The idea here is that you mow your lawn less often, let some of those little violets that are blooming this time of year uh, actually have the opportunity to grow. So let your lawn get a little longer, don't mow it as often, let some of those flowers come up in the summer months. Let, if there's any clover in your lawn, let that clover actually come up to the surface. Last summer, we started mowing our lawn much higher and we had so many bees of different shapes and sizes enjoying the, the clover flowers. And it was still very tidy. It wasn't, it wasn't messy looking at, at all because the clover stays so close to the surface of the ground that uh, it doesn't get unsightly at all, and you're doing a good thing environmentally. This is another in initiative, Healthy Yards, um, and there is a Westchester chapter. That's the link. You can go visit their website. And I want to commend the, um, the uh, Lewisboro Garden Club because they're listed as one of the organizations, partner organizations in this initiative from Westchester County. So kudos to your garden club. Now it's time for the chat box again. I'd like you to um, fill in the blank here with one of those words in the bullets there on the slide. Fill in the blanks with one of those, with one of those words. So marketing campaigns would have us believe that we need to keep feeding uh, products to our lawns. And as I was just saying, you really should only be doing that based on a soil test because you may not need anything to refurbish your lawn. So when we're constantly feeding synthetic chemicals to a lawn, it's like putting them on a junk food diet. It would be like us going to Burger King every single night and that, that would be our menu year round. You know that's not gonna have a good health outcome. And it's the same thing for your lawn. It's like keeping your lawn on a junk food diet. So kick that junk food. And the answer here to this question is soil. Healthy soil leads to a healthy lawn. You have to feed the soil, not the actual grass itself. So with healthy soil, you will end up getting uh, a lawn that's lush and green. Okay, so glad to see that so many of you said uh, soil, but compost is a great thing to put on your lawn too. In fact, um, overdressing your or top dressing your lawn in the fall with some compost is a great way to refurbish it. And that's a much more natural way to help feed the soil. And when you feed the soil, you're feeding the actual grass itself. All right, everyone.
just a, a few more things on lawns. You might not realize, and it might seem counterintuitive, but the longer you let your grass grow, the longer the root system underneath those grass blades is going to be. So keeping the lawn short to about a one inch height and, and cutting it frequently leads to a valid, very shallow rooted lawn. Also, when you irrigate your lawn frequently for very short durations of say five or 10 minutes a day, you're training the grass and the turf to have very shallow roots because they know and they can pick up um, all the water that's in the soil at the top, at the top inch or two of, of soil level. If you let the, the, the grass grow a little longer, you raise the height of your lawnmower blade, the length of the roots underneath will correspondingly uh, be longer as well. So uh, when I took my organic landscaping course, um, it was recommended that throughout the summer, we're mowing at three and a half inch height. So raise that lawnmower blade up as high as you can. And uh, there's information in the notes you received yesterday about the different heights over the growing season um, to operate your lawnmower at. So it stands to reason that the longer the roots go down into the soil, the more nutrients and the more water they can absorb. And also that's really important. We tend to get very hot, dry summers now. And I think that's gonna become more and more important um, as, as droughts become the norm, not the exception. So just a sort of a recap on lawns and weeds. Um, we have to focus on feeding the soil because when we feed the soil, all the little microorganisms in that soil interact with the roots of the grass and feed, actually feed those roots the nutrients that are in the soil. So you don't need those five-step programs, those synthetic chemicals. Um, one other thing that you might not realize is that when you um, actually leave the clippings on the lawn, you're providing 25% of the nitrogen that a lawn needs over the growing season. So you've already got a quarter of the nitrogen, and that's the first number on a fertilizer bag. You've already got 25% just by leaving those clippings right there. They also help uh, keep the soil moist because they're in, in essence mulching, um, making a mulch layer on top of the soil and they just disintegrate and get absorbed into the soil. You don't have to worry about that building up into thatch. Also an interesting study uh, came to life from out in Michigan and it was observed that when oak and maple leaves were were mowed on lawns and you know, chopped up by lawn mowers and just, again, allowed to stay there on the lawn, that there was a big drop off in the number of dandelions that were growing in those areas um, in the following year. So uh, this is a, an easy thing to do early in the fall before you start having like really heavy leaf drops. Please consider leaving the leaves there, just chopping them up. And again, great organic matter for your lawns. One other point I want to make about the um, about the those five step kind of weed and feed type programs with lawns, um, when though when excess nitrogen and phosphorus washes off our lawn, it really degrades the quality of the water and stream streams in our area. And in fact, nitrogen that first number on a fertilizer bag is supposed to help green up a lawn, but what happens when the excess uh, phosphorus and nitrogen rolls off and ends up in our water um, sources, it turns the ponds green. We want blue ponds, not green ponds. So really, really start being much more conservative with the application of fertilizers. And don't forget that fertilizers help weeds grow just as much as it helps the lawn grow. Now, there are lots of different tools that you can use to help ease your ease your uh, work. Um, I can uh, copy and paste this list of tools into the chat box at the end. Um, I'm just going to mention a few. Um, one thing that I find great is, is, an, is a bread knife that I bought at the dollar store. So for a dollar, you can have a really effective tool. It's great for uh, getting down in the soil around dandelions this time of year. Uh, this one has a tapered blade, which is really great for sinking down and getting around those tap roots. Um, you can also use something like a hori hori knife um, that's sometimes referred to as a Japanese garden knife. 
that works really well. Um, these other products that are here um, also work pretty effectively. Um, the um, Fiskars Stand Up Weeder is a great tool for those of you who have some issues with your knees or with, with your hips. Um, you can weed from a standing position. And uh, you can look that up on Amazon. Usually they have some little videos, watch the little videos for how that works. Also, you can use a flame weeder and um, there are different brands available. This is one brand, the Weed Dragon, but there's another one that I'm gonna show you from Johnny Seeds up in Maine. And um, before I do that though, I just wanna call out this last item on the, on the uh, slide and that is using a tarp. Um, I, I found out quite by accident a few years ago that a silver back tarp that's opened up on the lawn with the silver uh, side facing the sun can really help melt the weeds underneath. So I did that quite by accident, but it's a super, super way uh, to control like little patches of weeds around your property. So I'm thinking about trying that on my lawn in my backyard this fall. Um, moving it around so that I can try to get one particular nasty weed that we're about to see under control. Anyways, let's see how flame weeders work now. We're gonna switch over to this video and um, you want. So this is a flame weeder. You can buy these for home use with real, just a small portable propane tank. And again, this is one of those solutions you would use around um, concrete uh, between stone pathways and so on. I would not wanna see you using this around dry wood mulch uh, or where uh, any products like that are, are in the garden. This is really for getting rid of noxious weeds um, wherever you have a hard surface. But it is effective. And again, as we get older and our knees start wearing out, um, it's, it's something that you might find effective. And you can just go on YouTube and, and Google it. It's Johnny's Flame Weeder. And uh, it's just demonstrating the, how to use that particular um, tool for, sure. for weed control. Okay, so, um, so there's all kinds of tools that you can use. And um, some of them are things that you readily have on hand, others you may have to purchase. So just in summary now, before we get into our show and tell portion of the evening, I just wanted to sort of recap. So in order to get uh, weeds under control and to minimize problems in future years, just keep seeds out to start with. Um, I'm starting to really wonder if it's a good idea to be bringing plants home in soil contain in, that are planted up in soil from the garden center. I think that's where a good portion of um, weeds come from in my perennial gardens. Now, there's always storms blowing weed seeds in, birds fly over, they drop seeds. Um, you know, there are ways that seeds arrive in our property no matter what we do, and those things are hard to prevent. Um, but uh, clean your lawn mowers, that can help. If you have a weedy portion of your lawn, it can at least help uh, prevent portions of a weed from being transported to another area where it, where it could root and take hold. Um, as I said, mulching is, is good. You need to keep the soil shaded so that seeds can't sprout. And if they do, it's much easier to get rid of them when there's some mulch that keeps the soil moist um, underneath a growing area. Uh, get them when they're young. Don't let weeds, don't procrastinate. Weeding is something that needs to be tackled quickly. And that's one reason it's a good idea to walk around your gardens often and see what's going on so that you can spot weeds before they become a real problem. Never, never rototill any of the weeds that have any kind of a taproot or any kind of runner structure above or below ground because every little piece of that part of the plant, those things are called uh, propagules, any piece of that propagule can grab hold of the soil and start growing all over again. So instead of having one of those weeds, now you have potentially hundreds of that plant and you've made your problem much worse. Um, you can um, always please try to do the least harm, never use chemicals. And as a master gardener and organic land care professional, I am not authorized or um, 
allowed to give any recommendations on the use of chemicals. There are some great apps that you can use to help identify weeds. And those were listed in the uh, notes that I gave to Cindy for distribution yesterday as well. So um, I'm gonna attempt something now called uh, show and tell where I'm going to um, hold some weeds up in front of my um, computer, uh, the camera on my computer. <laughs> And I want to thank you. That's a double bonus of doing this talk for you tonight. I got some weeding done this afternoon when I was collecting these weeds for this evening. Just going to put a little cloth on my laptop so that I don't do any damage to the computer. So the first one up, anyone know what this is? No, 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 no. You can type your answer in chat if you think you, you might know what it is. This is actually bittercress. Um, and according to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, it's actually a favorite plant among wild foragers this time of year. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be shaking it so much. Apparently this plant is full of nutrients and it's it's great uh, to use for a spring tonic and when uh, you're getting a little tired um, of salad greens this time of year, you can try something different. This plant uh, sort of grows in a rosette shape and um, it will disguise itself among very fine leaved foliage. It's something that I found that weeds often sort of lurk in among silver, uh, very similar foliage. Um, this is getting ready to flower because this is a winter annual weed. There are winter annual weeds and summer annual or warm season annual weeds. Uh, so this is sending up spikes. It's going to develop a little white flower, four petals on the flower. When they drop off, seed pods form that are shaped just like a toothpick. And when the seeds inside ripen, one little tap against that toothpick capsule of seeds and it will spring open and the seeds apparently can fly as far as three feet uh, in the distance. So you may be finding the same plant within similar areas around your yard year by year. And that would be one reason in the case of uh, bittercress. It has, it travels, it spreads its joy around. Next up, we have something that may be very familiar to all of you. Who knows what this one is? Little tiny leaves, and it's just about to start flowering also. This is another one of those winter annuals, meaning that seeds um, sprouted last fall or in the very early winter, and this is already green and, and growing when the snows melt. Anyone know what that one is? It's not um, fragrant. I see someone asking that question. No, it's not fragrant. If you back it up just a little bit. Let me just tip that over. No. Little kind of pointed leaves. They often make a mat. This is one of those weeds that has a virtuous trait of um, actually um, protecting our soil by forming a mat over it and keeping it from blowing away. This is chickweed. Uh, chickweed um, often will grow uh, where there had been cultivated soil the previous year. Not unusual to find this in a, in a pot of soil in the springtime or a window box that still has soil in it from last year. Uh, chickweed can persist, the seeds from chickweed can persist for up to 25 years in the seed. <laughs> Um, let me, let me just read some of the other happy notes. Um, one single chickweed plant. I mean, look at all the little tips that can produce flowers. One of these little beasts can produce up to 15,000 seeds. Uh -huh. And even though it's flowering and you think, oh, I'm getting ahead of the problem because I'm, I'm getting rid of this weed before the flowers can set seed. Well, the sad news is, is that it, it can be sending out mature seeds at the same time it's still flowering. It's, it's, it's a little vicious plant. It's cute, but it's kind of vicious. Um, you, can get your, um, you can get your vengeance on chickweed though, by making one of these, a chickweed cocktail. <laughs> I, uh, will you include the recipe for that? 
<laughs> Actually, um, I'll that's something else I'll send to Cindy. Uh, there's a, a podcast I listen to, plantrama.com. And uh, one of the ladies is a wild forager. And uh, she put this recipe up on their website. So plantrama.com, Google chickweed cocktail. But I'll send the information to Cindy as well. Um, the happy news just continues here. <laughs> Next, we have a biennial weed. So how many, how, many years, how many years does a biennial plant live? One, two, or three? Oh, it has to be three. Biennials, how many years do they live? Two. Two, yeah, two. But that B-I, bi, means yeah. two. And who knows what this little darling is? Does it smell? It does. It smells like it might be in the allium family. Garlic mustard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's the flower. You're probably seeing those white flowers everywhere right now. Um, the first year, this is a biennial. So the first year, it's, it just has a little row set of kind of um, scalloped leaves at the ground level, then sends up these spikes in year two. So this is the year two plant. And it's flowering now. You see this all along the roadsides at the edges, maybe of your own property. Um, garlic mustard uh, is, a, is also a prolific seed producer. And it also develops capsules at the tip of uh, the branches where the seeds are held. Uh, the seeds can persist for a long time in the soil. Um, so between the, the high number of seeds it produces and one other characteristic, um, it, it is very persistent in the landscape. The other characteristic it has is it's, it has allelopathy, alleliopathy rather, meaning that the roots send out chemicals that make it hard for other plants to survive in that soil. So those chemicals um, are, are helping this plant persist. You can use the leaves. It is garlic mustard. You can use these leaves to make pesto and many people do, and you can Google that. You can find lots of recipes on the internet. Uh, one point I do wanna make is all of these weeds that I've mentioned are edible or like that you can make pesto with, make sure they've not been sprayed with any kind of lawn chemicals or any kind of herbicides. Um, and be 100% sure you know what it is that you're eating or turning into cocktails before you actually do that. So that was our only biennial guest this evening. And next up, of course, we have one I think that's quite familiar to everyone. Now we're in the category of perennial weeds. And perennials, just like the, the prized perennials we have in our gardens, perennials persist because they have uh, usually some kind of a root structure or a bulb that helps them store up energy, get them through the winter, and then regenerate from the ground up the next year. So who knows what this one is? Like dandelion. dandelion. Yeah, wilted as it is. Yes, it is a dandelion. Um, so dandelions are another terrific food source. In fact, I was reading that every portion of the plant is edible. And I thought the leaves probably would be used to make wine, but I read that it's actually the flowers that are used for making wine. Um, the uh, leaves are also very nutritious and the roots uh, are very similar to chicory, can be used for a, a, a substitute for coffee. Um, they do have tap roots. So that's one of those plants where the trusty bread knife uh, can help work them out of the soil. There are a lot of things that you'll read saying that um, they're a great early uh, source of pollen for our pollinators. Um, there's some debate about that. It may not be a very high quality pollen. Um, but one thing that is great about them is I noticed, and I've noticed this now for a couple of years in a row, um, all the little songbirds around the yard, when the seed heads start forming, they jump on the dandelions. And sometimes they'll actually start at the soil level and they'll inch their way up the stem and push the flower, the seed head over and peck all seed heads off mm. and eat the seeds. So I don't have a bird feeder anymore, too many bears where I live, um, but I have a natural in, uh, I have a natural bird feeder with my dandelion crop. That uh, stand up 
Fisker's four-pronged weeder is a great way to, to get dandelions out of the soil without having to bend down or needle. Um, the next one is a absolutely on my most hated list. It's a real problem for me right now. Who knows what this one is? You're not going to say a joke. Creeping Charlie? It is creeping Charlie. Yes. Uh, it's, it looks similar to a juga, a rose. I can see why you said that. And a juga is flowering. Um, some forms of a juga are flowering right but now. It's tall. Yeah. Yeah. With a little flower. A juga sends up that little mm -hmm. spike. Um, this is creeping Charlie. Um, ground ivy is another uh, way that people refer to it. The nasty thing about this is that every place the plant touches the ground, it can form new roots and form a new plant that will then go on and root everywhere it touches the ground. And on and on it goes. So it's really hard to control. Um, if it gets a little higher in, um, in the lawn, our lawnmowers are just gonna cut it off and break it and everywhere that little piece hits the ground, it's gonna root again. So it's one of those ones that uh, it's really hard to prevent from spreading. It's not fun. Um, that's, that's the plant that I'm gonna try to tackle this week, this fall in my backyard using a silver back tarp. Um, so ground ivy has several lookalikes. Um, two common lookalikes are, are a plant called henbit and another one is called purple bed metal. But they're annual plants, so they'll only live for a single year and then they die. Unlike this one that just comes back year after year. Okay, the final uh, plant that I have for you in our show and tell is another plant that develops a taproot, but it might not be the kind of taproot we associate with something like a dandelion. So that's the roots there. And this is the plant. Plantain. It is, it's plantain. Oh, plantain is in a weed. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all in your perspective, right? Because the definition of a weed is an unwanted plant. So you might want it, somebody else might not. Yeah, and it, it does have some uh, medicinal benefits. It's supposed to be very good at uh, preventing itch or controlling itch from insect bites and so on. And it's the white man's footprint. White man's footprint. And yeah. what that, what Rose is referring to there is in the late summer, um, out of the center of this plant, it almost looks like there's one here, but this is a leaf that's uncurling. There will be a short stubby seed stalk that comes up. And those seeds stick to the sole of your, of your footwear and we track it around. And that's one way that this plant spreads by seeds. And it's amazing, even though these roots are kind of short, it's amazing how hard they hold on when you try to pull this out of the soil. You really need one of those uh, little cultivator tools uh, to, to try to get it out. So that concludes my show and tell. Um, you know, Michelle, I'm wondering before we go and we ask folks for their um, samples, might we answer uh, one or two of the questions uh, or a few of the questions that came up? Um, one of the questions was, does solarizing kill grass too? Uh, that is if you have weeds growing on a lawn, of course. Yes. It will. It will, yes. Right. Um, so you would want to use solarizing where you have a really weedy patch. So that's that picture I had of my lawn with the little lizard. Um, I would say if, like if an area gets to be like 50% or 75% weeds, Solarizing might be something you want to do. Um, but again, you know, solarizing is not really going to kill off tap roots and something like a dandelion. You may still have to try to work out some of those root structures um, after solarizing for three to five days. Okay. Um, there was a question, and I think you kind of answered it, but just in case, what is your opinion on weed and feed as a preventative measure? Um, I, I think they need for preventive measure of weeds for springtime application. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of concerns about them because uh, they're synthetic products 
-hmm. and synthetic products um, tend to be very fast acting and then they're all used up by the plant. Well, it, they might kill off the, the weeds, but they have a lot of fertilizers mixed in with them. So it greens up the, the, the turf grass, kills off the weeds, but you're putting a lot of chemicals into the environment. So let's say you go out, you spread that weed and feed and we get one of those crazy rainstorms. I mean, yesterday was a nice, slow, drizzly rain all day that could soak in. We almost never get rains like that anymore. We get torrential downpours all that washes off into our streams and that leads to water problems. Usually later on in the summer, it starts, you know, everybody's stuff is washing off their lawns into their, into our streams. And we get that green scum on top of the ponds as a result. Um, the other factor with a lot of these things now that we're finding out is that they can harm the organisms in the soil. So soil has, a, it's a natural living thing. And um, a lot of them are very detrimental to that soil life as well. So I'm not a fan. Um, on the, okay. yeah. All right, that's a reasonable answer. Uh, just as an information for people, um, uh, Cornell and Rutgers offer soil testing for $25, just so folks know that. Um, another question on, do you have any pointers for removing wisteria? Um, a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> a pickaxe, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah probably a pickaxe. Um, that's one of those, that's one of those really aggressive plants. Uh, the the Native American wisteria plant, you can mm -hmm. you have to search that out. It's not as easily found as the imported Asian one. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would just say repeated cuttings. So uh, just keep cutting the wisteria back down to ground level. And um, usually cutting any plant when it's in flower is a good time to cut it because it has put a lot of energy into regrowing vegetation uh, for the season. And then it's put even more energy that it had stored up in its roots uh, into the effort of flowering. So the plant is usually at its weakest at that point. It's a good time to cut it. Okay. Uh, we have a fan of dandelions. I'm sorry, Eileen, I agree with you. Yes, <laughs> dandelions yeah, have a place. Are good. Um, and da, 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 you have, uh, which, is the, which is the better method for eliminating weeds from a small patch of ground, solarizing the soil or using a silver tarp? So it, it, de it depends, I guess, what you're trying to do. Um, the, um, the silver tarp is, there's almost no effort involved other than opening up the tarp. Um, again, that method kills off the grass underneath and some of the surface weeds that might be growing. Um, but anything like a dandelion that's been there for three or four years, neither one, neither the tarp or the solarizing is probably going to um, uh, cut, kill, you know, sort of knock them back enough that they're not going to re-sprout. But it gives you a start. That's, that's what those two methods do. Solarizing is used a lot in the agricultural field. Um, if you go on the website, awaytogarden.com by Margaret Roach up in Copaic Falls, awaytogarden.com, um, and Google her podcast. There's an episode she did, I think it was just last year with a University of Maine um, student or graduate student um, who was looking into solarizing methods. Um, mm -hmm. One is not better than the other, uh, but solarizing takes a little more work to prepare. Okay. Um, are there any suggestions on, on controlling Asian or Indian strawberry? I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not familiar with, with that. Uh, if it's the wild type of strawberry that gets the little red berries, um, that's one that runs on runners or that, yeah. you know. That's what I'm thinking she meant too. I'm not sure if the person wants to, to uh, elaborate on that, but that's what I'm thinking the person meant. Yeah. Um, that would be a situation where the, the silver tarp or the uh, solarizing might just be a Yeah. So, yeah. Um, because right, it's just surface, yeah. It kills the surface. They're on the surface, so yeah. I would think with, especially in the hot, hot weather in summer, I would think that solarizing or the silver tarp would 
would be effective against those runners and should not it should knock back the vegetation substantially in a couple of days. And then any pieces of runner that are on the surface should be pretty easy to, to pick out. Um, oh, you know, and I did see this, but this is Pat Maniac. Uh, it's not, I'm not sure how to say your last name. Wild strawberries have white flowers. Yes. Um, Asian strawberries are the ones with the yellow. Yeah. Right. right. Um, same answer. Uh, yeah. Trying yeah. to remove mugwort from the, <laughs> oh, mugwort, the bane of uh, trying to remove mugwort from the, uh, the, the bank of a, of pond. a pond. Any suggestions? Um, order some pizza and get a case of beer and invite your friends. <laughs> <laughs> now that, this is a, this is a really particularly, um, thuggish. Well, it's a thuggish plant, but this situation is, is made more, it is more precarious because of the presence of a pond. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're trying to remove, um, uh, anything near a pond, um, you should never use any kind of chemical herbicides. In fact, your town probably has rules prohibiting the use of any kind of herbicide near the pond. Um, mugwort is one of those things with a thick root structure. Uh, it it uh, goes along um, under the ground and just at the surface. So that's one where you have to work at it, work on a little bit at a time and try to get every piece of the root. I've had it try to take hold if beside my garage and I just kept after it one year and it's pretty good. Every year there oh. might be half a dozen more. Now I've okay. been able to, I've been able to, to keep it pretty, pretty well under control. Now, the other thing, I don't know that you wanna do this near a pond, it depends on how much slope you have. That's a situation where a really thick layer of mulch might help. So you tackle, you get rid of as much of the vegetation of the mugwort, of the mugwort as possible. Then you could put down um, a layer of thick cardboard or like a layer of like 10 sheets of black and white newspaper, wet it with a garden hose and then pile like up to six inches of mulch as long as the mulch doesn't slide into the pond. And that could help smother any bits of root that are still in the soil. Okay. I hope um, uh, this person, this is a good question. I'm sure a lot of people don't know how to do, how do, you, how do we uh, remove poison ivy safely? Um, th that's tricky and you wanna be careful. Um, if you're already sensitive to poison ivy, you get more sensitive every time you're exposed to it. Um, I've heard people talk about um, putting on a layer of clothes, like basically you want to almost have like a, a hazmat suit or like a, a, a set of coveralls, if you, especially if you're very sensitive. And if it's a very mature vine, you know, that's already gotten pretty thick and is, you know, working its way up into a tree. In that kind of a situation, you need heavy duty protection. Uh, some people will wear up to three layers of gloves. Um, and when you take your gloves off, in fact, I have a glove right here. <laughs> So when you take your glove off, um, you just have to sort of strip it off and turn it inside out so that any oil from the poison ivy that got on the outside of the glove doesn't get rubbed onto your skin or you don't inadvertently brush it over your clothes. Um, what some folks do so that you, you, another suggestion is they plastic bag. They plastic bag over there, there, you know, like you can use over the glove bags or whatever, but you do that over your gloves. Yeah. Because otherwise, if you're real sensitive, you may not want to use the gloves again. So the, the Ziplocs can help save you sometimes. Yeah, and absolutely. Tech New is the, I don't know if you would talk to them about the Tech New product. Yeah, Tech New. And um, I'll just, do you want to type that into the chat, Rose, or I can? Sure, I'll type it. Okay. In fact, I just used some Technu the other day because my fingers were really itchy and I had been cutting away some things, some invasives, and I wondered if I had touched some poison ivy somewhere. Um, with the poison ivy, if, if you're really sensitive and it's a really mature vine, you may need to call in professional help. That's what some yeah. land conservation uh, organizations do. Okay. Um, do we want some more questions or do we does want the vinegar, salt, detergent, wheat killer help with poison ivy? 
I doubt it. You could try if it was a very small piece. So I'm seeing all kinds of little tiny bits. They're very they're really red. Now. Yeah. yeah, they're really red when they just come out of the, the ground and they're really shiny. You could probably use that solution on something like that. One thing I want to say about that solution is you have to shield your um, desirable plants, protect them with a piece of cardboard or something so that that spray doesn't hit them because that's a non-selective treatment, meaning anything it touches, it could damage. Um, well, if people yeah. have some samples, I, I, you know, I, I'd love to try, like, could we take five minutes and just- Sure, like, okay. sure. Okay. And, and Cindy, is that okay with you at the library? Is, is Oh yes, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, anybody want to take a chance? I do, I do, I do. Good, good, good. So this is what I saw, but I just cover my, I'm going to cover my, thing. this is what I've got. You can see it. Okay. I can tell you what it is, or you can try to identify it. Maybe that will give you a little idea if you can look for the little tubers there. Um, I'm guessing that that's a native violet. No. No. Cylinder? Yeah. It's it, lower, yeah. lower celandine. Yeah. It's the invasive, invasive celandine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a tough one. Um, it's so pretty, okay. right? And it's yeah. easy to confuse with, um, I'm just looking at. Wash marigolds is the one to look for if you like the yellow flower in the shape of the leaf. The cell, that's the marsh marigold is the native. Yeah. And that is not a weed. It will not take over your entire garden. It will grow where you put it. How can I get rid of ferns growing in my... Susan, do you know what kind of ferns you have? Are they ostrich ferns or what kind of ferns? Just plain old green ones. I really don't know. Oh, okay. It depends. You really want to get rid of them? You might... Can you... you well, okay. Might give them away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could donate them to a native plant sale, maybe. Um, <laughs> I would say um, with the ferns, Susan, that there's something going on with the soil conditions there. So um, I love ferns at, actually at the edge of my property because they grow up naturally and they hide all the vegetation from my daffodils that are gonna be going by now in the next week or two. Um, so ferns want a very moist, uh, consistently moist soil with, with sort of a lot of um, tilth to the, not a lot of tilth to the soil. They want very specific woodland conditions though. And there's also sometimes very specific microorganisms in the soil that help those ferns persist. So why don't you look up um, the growing conditions for ferns and maybe see if you can adjust the soil conditions or the nutrients somehow. And that might help Susan, but I can't make any promises. Okay, it's anybody else have, oh, uh, have a plant they would like identified? Hi, um, so we're going to offer this plant, um, has leaves like this, and it's starting to flower, or of a purple, and hold still. <laughs> is that a, th is, is it, is it, what's it, is it pointy, or I mean, is it thorny? No. No, it's got some fine hairs in the stem. Okay. Um, it's growing in this clump, and I'm not sure if it's supposed to be there. Audrey, where did you find it growing? Sort of what kind of conditions? Shady, sun. Sunny area, shade. Wet. Yeah, I'm pretty dry, sunny. Pretty dry and sunny. Near a fence um, on a big lawn. Okay. Um, I'm, if you want to, Audrey, I'm gonna put my email address in here. Um, you can send me a picture of the plant. Um, like a close-up of the leaves and a close-up of the of the uh, flowers oh, at the top. Yeah. Maybe when the flower is open, Audrey, it will be a little easier to identify, but you're welcome to send me a picture and I'll help. I'll try to help you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. thanks okay. for bringing that, Audrey. Anyone else? If nobody else will go, I'll go. Okay. Um, do you see these guys? Yeah. They have the small leaves. And it's got these very long, they're almost sticky. Oh, I wonder if that's catch bed straw. You know, see, I, 
Oh, it is a kind of a square stem. But you know, I, I like bed straw. This is not, yeah. Cat's bed straw? Catch, catch as in catch in your catch, clothes. Catch. Okay. You know, it almost looks a little bit too. I, I'm not getting a good look at the leaf there, Rose, but it almost looks like another type of cress. Well, when you, I, when you brought up the watercress, the, 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 whatever, that's what Mary, I thought of. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if it is. Mary Eggleton would know that. I think that's that mustard thing because I've got that all in my yard and she has it in hers. Oh, okay. yeah. So, leaves, so I got dirt on my head. The, the same seed heads like the one that you that first one you showed okay so yeah i okay. i think that uh marianne was onto something there did it have yellow flowers rose uh it had white flowers actually right there are wild there is what i call a wild mustard that has white flowers as well oh, okay okay interesting all right because it, it, right. it actually if you taste it or smell it it smells like mustard oh marianne is thinking purslin huh I don't know. Okay. Or or mustard, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. All right. I, I think that might be it. Um, uh, I, I, as we close, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, I always always learn something, and uh, you know something that I can actually use. I like that solarizing and the talk. No, really, that was a good idea. Um, Thank you, Michelle, for joining us this evening. Thank sure. you, Cindy, for your help. Um, and I believe you said you put your email in the... I did. You did. Okay. Um, so, um, and you also, don't you have a website with... Um... I do. Um, so my email address is gardenadviceguru.com. Oh, sorry, at gmail.com. Okay. At, g at gmail.com. And... I guess I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And, and my website is gardenadvice.guru. Okay. So it's .guru, not a .com or a .net. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And You're good welcome. night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, hope to see you at our next Zoom in June. <laughs>